Hi, I'm Christian Griego with Getz and Edwards, and I'm joined today by Peter Moore of the London Symphony Orchestra. Principal is, what's the exact title? Principal, that's it, yeah. Boom, nailed Yeah, it. you nailed it. <laughs> you came in uh, yesterday, and it's your first time to Elkhorn, Wisconsin. Yeah, I can't believe I've never been to Elkhorn before, but yeah, my first time here. Um, and what were you in, in the States for? So I had a concert in Vancouver, I had a recital, and then I did some work there, and then thought, why not stop in and see the factory, you guys on the way home. So what, what did you play in your recital? Oh, all sorts of stuff. It was an hour and 20 minutes of uh, trombone and piano music. So we played um, some Chrysler pieces. We played some Arthur Pryor pieces, you know, the, where the trombone came from. We played some Bach. Um, yeah, all sorts of stuff. Bach's terrifying. Bach is terrifying. It's like standing there with no clothes on. Yeah. Which, um, which, which suite was it that you played? The second one. But yeah. they're all hard. So yeah. they're, 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 in their own ways, yeah. yeah. It, it's like, for me, Bach is like golf. golf. Mm -hmm. you, you can't win. There's always a, an area that it, it shows me where I need to practice personally. No, it forces you to be incredibly honest with your playing and strips it all right back, putting things under the microscope, essentially. So doing these recitals, this is, is this the first time in the States doing a recital? No, I've done a few trips to the States, but nothing post-pandemic. So it feels like a very long time. The last time I was in the States for solo stuff was um, 2018, I think, in South Carolina at Spoleto Festival. So yeah. how is the trombone world different for you in the UK um, post-COVID versus pre-COVID? Uh, difficult one to answer. I mean, a lot of things have come back, but I think they've come back differently. Um, traveling is a challenge now so much more of a challenge and even though you know the airlines tell you that it's all back to normal and you can travel freely it doesn't seem to be that way so that's a bit of a um, bit of a struggle but um, yeah things are kind of picking up slowly and um, I've been happy to get my own projects off the ground again um, yeah just before the pandemic I had a sabbatical for my job to focus on my own projects and uh, I had a year pretty much a year worth of stuff lined up, which of course all disappeared overnight. Oh my gosh, so your so, sabbatical was... That was my time to really kind of push my own projects and... Uh, and it turned into a COVID. It did. Recession. It did. <laughs> but, you know, people have got worse stories, so... Were, were you able to record and do things during that period? Yeah, I mean, I didn't really get on board with that stuff. Not out of the want of, for the want of trying. I did try very hard, but I'm not very technologically minded. Mm -hmm. and uh, setting up microphones and cameras and all that stuff. Oh, even here, you see what we're yes. doing. Like, just to get this going, we have to, we have to get the lights, we have to get the camera ready, and there's yeah. two or three people helping and making yeah. sure things, it's, it's, it can become overbearing. It's an operation. Or overwhelming, yeah. 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 And without, without helpers, I mean, none of this could be truly possible. Absolutely. Got some um, great helpers back there, but they're not going to be on the camera, so. <laughs> um, Lex Lexi and Jesse. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, it, it is, and for me, I, I don't think I could do this without the help of, of people mm. um, like that. So in your projects, are you doing some recordings? Yeah, well, we just recorded, well, last year we recorded um, a new concerto written for me by composer Danny Howard, and um, that's going to be released very soon with the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra. Um, yeah, I'm trying to get the plans together to make more discs, um, so hopefully... In the next two or three years, there'll be a lot more out there. Albums, final? Yeah. Well, he said yes. I, I heard it. Yes. He said yes. I've seen his turntables oh, this morning. God. <laughs> <laughs> That's a world I don't understand, but yeah, amazing. No, uh, so doing recordings, wh why in today's time do you want to do recordings? When people don't even have CD players, why, why as a musician should you do recordings? I think it, well, first of all, it's a, it's a question of access, giving people access to your playing and sharing with people that wouldn't get to, you wouldn't get to play to and perform to live. Mm -hmm. That's a big part of it. Um, recordings, I think we've, we're now quite obsessed with that word perfection, um, which for me doesn't really exist in terms of artistry and music making. But um, yeah, I suppose I like to think of recordings as just a moment in time a kind of uh, a snapshot of where you were at that moment. So it's nice to look back. It's kind of, it's kind of personal endeavors, really. It's personal projects. I, just, I don't really think of it as like promotion or doing it because I have to do it. I want to do it because I want to look back and remember 
what I was doing at that time and how I sounded and um, you know, a record's for life. So once it's, there's something quite amazing about making something and then it, and releasing it and then it's there. It's out in the open and. And the interesting know. thing, interesting thing about this is somebody in Australia could buy one of your recordings. You could ship it to them, and then they have you mm -hmm. to study the way you play, your articulation, your sound concepts, and um, that for me, I, I love recordings for that reason, and I, I, I use them. Um, we were talking earlier about London Symphony, and I have old albums from you know the, the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s London Symphony, and I will go back and I'm listening for the, for the brass section yeah. and to see how they changed through the years. And even yeah. and, and that's an interesting thing, because a lot of times the hall stays the same, but the members change. Absolutely, and I think that the sound obviously has changed, because it does change with new members and with, with um, new conductors and new music being written. But there's still it retain, that orchestra retains a special quality. I think that goes way way back hundred years. You know. So were you scared to be trying new equipment on the on the stand with your peers, and and how, what is the process that you did because you had a product that worked and works. So at, you, what you have is here, and so when we started, um, I first got the call that you were interested in testing some things. I got a few things together and um, sent them over. Um, what was the process there? And what, do you, are you afraid of trying new things in that regard? Absolutely not, I was excited. I was more excited than anything else. Um, but I think the first thing is to not overcomplicate it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's all this possibility now in the world that we didn't have even a few decades ago. Yeah. So, um, don't overthink it. You know, if there's something that allows you to make the sound that you have in your head, that's a very, very big plus. Um, and also just ease of getting around the instrument. Um, can it switch between styles? Can it switch between timbres? And um, it became quite obvious very quickly, actually, that this instrument was going to do all those things for me. Um, so it was kind of a no-brainer. And I didn't really think twice about whether it would fit into the orchestra because I knew that if it would make the if it made the sound I wanted it to then you, that's it blending is a concept yeah. more and it's yeah so you won your job when you were 18 years old I was co-principal when I was 18 so co-principal yeah. um I, I now I, I go to a lot of orchestra concerts and there are people from age 75 to 18 mm. what were some of the challenges of being one of the youngest members of the orchestra at that time, or the youngest member at that time? Yeah, I was the youngest member, I think, for six years. Mm -hmm. I'm not entirely sure about that, but it's around about five or six years. And uh, it didn't really feel like a thing at all, really. I've, I've, I grew up in brass bands, surrounded by older people from when I was really little. So um, that's never really been a, a concern of mine, um, musically or socially, you know. So sitting, going in, and it was just normal? Yeah. It was normal, and I think one of the good things about maybe that orchestra in particular, the LSO, is that they did and do have this reputation for get, bringing in young talent and call it nurturing, but you know, I think just finding good young players and putting right. them in there. Yeah. So um, yeah, I didn't really clock onto any of that. I was just, you know, you just turn up and play and do your best. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. I mean, it, it's interesting because um, there's so many people. I, recently, I was working with a young bass trombone player, and um, fantastic, and in high school. Mm. And I said, I, I think you're close already. I think you should start taking auditions. Mm. And I, I don't think I've ever said that in the United States, but a couple times. Yeah. And, and it was funny because the, the player looked at me and goes, well, but no, I have to go to college. I have to get a master's. I'm going to study here, 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 and here, and here. And I was like, I... Yeah, but you'll be in debt after that. So. Yeah, yeah, there is that. But and if you have the capabilities, just put yourself out there and try and show up. And you never know what could happen because um, this player had the tools. And mm -hmm. I, I think mm -hmm. maybe one year, maybe two years, and Absolutely. probably will be in a job. Yeah, um, that's and then, really exciting. Yeah, yeah and, and it's, it's great to hear and it's, it's refreshing to hear um, young players uh, coming up at such a high level. And I think the internet helps now, mm. um, where people can go and listen to, I'm, I, I can listen to players in Hungary. And yeah. I, can, I can jump yeah. around the world in an hour's time yeah. and listen with YouTube and, or anywhere. I mean, mm. SoundCloud, so many people uploading their, their content to SoundCloud and, and sharing their, their music. It's, it's an amazing world 
where Absolutely. you can find these. So doing more solo recitals, mm. is that something that we, we're going to be um, looking for you to I do? I so. Well, I certainly want to get to the States more, if possible. Um, well, there's, I mean, it's, it's a big country. And I, I, if anybody's out there that, you know, uh, we have a few schools and we have different events. And I, I think if, um, if there's anybody that wants Peter to come out, we'll put inf contact information, the website information, all down in, in the uh, description below. So you can find that there. Um, you are doing some teaching, but mainly yeah. performing and a few master classes. Mainly performing. Um, I found six or seven years ago that actually I was on the point when I was doing so much that everything I was doing wasn't quite as good as I wanted it to be. The quality control was not really there because I was essentially burning myself out doing too much. Um, so now I'm very careful about doing a lot, but not too much. So everything can be at the level that I want it to be. Yeah. I'll, I'll go through periods of my life where I have to pull back a little mm. bit because I'll, I'll overextend myself. It's really important. You know, I'd be doing a recital one day and then the next day you're in with the orchestra for <clears throat> six, six hours at a time playing a big symphony and then the next day you're in the recording studio and then you're teaching and it's fun. And London's one of those cities where things fly at you fast and you either deal with them or you don't. You know, that's kind of the attitude. Um, but I thought, hang on a minute, I want to take a little bit more control and uh, now I have time to make sure I'm feeling good and make sure I'm always on top of my playing. Very, very important. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of where I am. But the, uh, the solo, I mean, I was a soloist before I was an orchestral player. Oh, really? You know, I've been a soloist for 15 years. Wow. But I've only been an orchestral player for nine, <laughs> you know, so. So the brass band as a soloist in front of the brass bands? Yeah, in front of the brass bands, but then after the BBC competition, 2008, um, there were all these opportunities to go and stand out the front of orchestras even and, uh, and chamber music. Um, so that's very, very much a, a big part of me, of my growing up. Interesting. Yeah. Do you, are you, are you um, following new compositions and trying to get new compositions or? We have to, I mean, we've got to do that as trombone players because we don't have a lot really. There's not a great deal that, we're, that we get to choose from. Um, so, yeah, finding the exciting new composers of today and hopefully convincing them to write for this most noble of instruments is, is the goal. I think it has to be um, because we can't keep playing the same tired repertoire over and over again. Yeah, I, I mentioned to you uh, earlier about how we, we, we show up to um, anything and it's the, sometimes the same pieces over mm. and over, which is great. If, if you're, you're coming up and you need to understand the repertoire, there's a yes. point where you have to play the rep, the rep, I get it. But then there's a point where you need to push the boundaries of composition and new mm. music so that we're not, uh, in your 50 years from now, in your 70s playing the same pieces that you're doing right now. Yeah, it's, no, I can't, yeah, I can't imagine that. But, you know, it's a, it's a difficult one because if everybody turns up and plays the David, then if we're not careful, we end up just playing it like everybody else. And everybody kind of blends together and makes this one version of the David. And actually there are a million different ways you can play it. But right. if we're playing tied repertoire, the, the natural tendency is to go, oh, we're playing repertoire that everybody knows, so we'll just play it the same as everybody else. So that's another problem as well. We can also break out of that, I think. So when you're traveling, different subject, but when you're traveling, how do you balance um, your health and tra I know you, you, you played a little football, um, uh, soccer. Um, mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and how do you balance uh, traveling and your health? I'm just kind of curious. With difficulty, uh, it's always a challenge to balance life, work, health, playing. Um, if I could design my own diary, I would be able to do it because I would, you know, work for two or three weeks and have some time at home and then some practice time, then go away again and then return. But we all know it kind of doesn't really work like that. Engagements come when they come and yes. you, you either do them or you don't. Right. Um, so quite often you know that you really want to do something, but it's maybe not the best time. So then you've got a decision to make. Do I really want to do this? Is it worth it, even though I'm not feeling my best? Um, or I know that I won't be feeling my best because it's a very busy time. Um, so that's the constant balancing act. And um, yeah, but important to look after yourself and, and, and eat the right foods and keep exercising. And, you know, you know, I'm still a young guy, but I'm not 19 anymore. Yeah. So there comes a point where you think, well, actually, I need to start 
looking after myself. And maybe just because I can stay up till three in the morning, maybe it doesn't mean that I should, because right. I've got to think about this concert tomorrow. And yeah. also the more I think about playing, the more I think about conditioning myself. And we talked about earlier about looking for that one to three percent. You're yeah. looking for that change, one to three percent, because you know that you're confident in what you can do, but you're fine tuning, you're trying to find an extra edge um, for yourself, not compared to other people. You're trying to push yourself, you know. And um, then it became very obvious to me that I need to really look after the body and condition the body because it, that has such an effect on your playing. Really Short does. term and long term. Longevity, longevity is everything in this business. Yeah. That's interesting you say that. Mm. Yeah. So where do you see yourself in 10 years? Mm. What's ideal for you in 10 years? Hopefully back here with you. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, talk a little bit about... Now that you've been here for the first time, mm. what, what are the benefits of visiting us here? Well, it's totally fascinating, really, because I only see the trombone when it looks like that. And of course, I know that there's so much effort and work that's gone into producing that. But I don't really appreciate it. How can I? Because I've not seen it. But now I've had the, the factory tour and I know how much attention goes into every little stage of it. And um, it's just really interesting to see how it all comes together, if you're interested in instruments, which I am. Now, your slide, you, you thought was fantastic before you came here? Mm, yeah, I did think it was pretty good. Yeah. But you guys said the slide was actually okay. It was the bell that had some stuff stuck in it. Yeah, and we also cleaned the slide and went through it, so the action, you, you, can, imp you can always improve upon where you were. You can, and the, the rotary, the rotor was an absolute yeah. disaster. Yeah, uh, uh, we knew that Peter had cats, not because he told us, it's just one, but it's a very hairy one. <laughs> and we knew it was a long-haired cat. <laughs> and it was, we get to know players without, you know, <laughs> even talking to them a lot of times, just by holding their instruments, going through them, and cleaning them. Mm. Um, and it, it, the cat must have been in my case at some point. <laughs> of course. But yeah. Well, no, cats, that's what they do. If you leave a, a case open, they're yeah. going to, I mean, even with, like, uh, Amazon boxes, anything, they just, yeah. I have two cats, so... Gracie and George, if you want to know their names. <laughs> I know you don't, but Gracie and George, they're part of the family. Yeah, How do but you I know what you're going to lead this to. Okay. And it's, don't be so oblivious to what's happening to your instrument. Oh, I didn't say that. You he know. did. <laughs> <laughs> look, you really do need to look after it. Um, and um, I'll certainly be back here at some point to get it, give it a thorough check over. I've seen people that buy new instruments because theirs was just poorly maintained. Yeah. And I've even, uh, I had someone come in with uh, a Bach 42 and it had valve issues. I, I actually said, can I just, and I actually realigned it and got it back in playing order. And then I was like, then you, now you can make a decision. They're like, no, we're gonna buy a new instrument. And we, they did, they, they, mm. they were ready to, cause they didn't like the sound concept they were at. But yeah. I, I didn't want to have a poorly maintained instrument going up, a, up no. correctly because, and then I, I wanted them to understand that even with the Edwards, if you buy an Edwards or a Getson, if you poorly maintain it, not that you were poorly maintain it, your cat. Yeah, you know, was I'd say I was kind of average to, uh, yeah, compared I, to the stories that yeah, I've heard. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we didn't get any green stuff <laughs> per se. Um, but no, there's just little things that if, if, we were saying. What, what's the important thing? Be friends with like a great repair tech or somebody that can maintain your instrument mm -hmm. for you because what do you want to do with, with life? Clean, rotor alignments. Play. You, you want to. You want to take things off and make sure that they're 100%. Yeah. No, you want to practice. Yeah. And that's fine. That's, there's no issue with that at all. Just every year or two, drop in. Come see Jesse and myself, yeah. we'll, we'll take care of it. I also think, just for example, in this trombone, every little component of it has been perfected yeah. and crafted to in such attention to detail. It really is astonishing. And I've learned a lot more about that today. But knowing now how much work goes into this, the least I can do is keep my instrument clean. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's really not that much effort when I look at what happens here. Well, yeah, and it, there, but there is a lot that a repair tech or somebody can do if you don't. Oh, have, yeah, you don't have an ultrasonic. No, you know, but in terms example. of getting hair out of my instrument. Right. Yeah. Wow, there's that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, don't use an ultrasonic um, unless it's with a trusted repair tech because they can blow your lacquer off. If the if the temperature gets over 140 degrees, it can blow your lacquer off. There's so many ways yeah. that people have these these cheap. cheap ultrasonics now, the transducers, um, anyway, if the bubble of energy is too big, it can destroy your instrument. Yeah. Well, when we started doing aqueous cleaning with huge ultrasonics in the Getzen factory, um, we destroyed a few instruments because they're so strong that we were actually able to etch the brass and wreck the instruments. Because mm. we were curious, okay, well, and then we backed off until we 
got where we wanted yeah. to be. But um, there's, you have to be careful and have a trusted uh, source for these things. Um, who's your repair tech in, in London? Do I have one? Point made. <laughs> See, <laughs> what? I, yeah. No, performers are performers, mm. and and that's fine. It's a separate job. Yeah, yeah. So w w I'm going to find you a friend. Okay. Oh, I'll just fly here. That's yeah. not very good for the environment. <laughs> <laughs> but you understand. The best, I mean, I've had so many players come through here that mm. and they, they'd, they'd be on stage playing incredibly, and then I'd go back and feel their slide, and it's like, oh, well, yeah. Well, it, it, your slide was not like this. I mean, by well, any means. Because I'm a very good boy, I oil it yeah. once a week and spray yeah. it every day. So. With valve oil? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> what do you use? I'm just curious for your, on your slide. I don't know. I don't think it's Getson. It's fine. Getson doesn't make. Uh, I don't slide. know what it is. It's just. Uh, just slide cream. I don't know. I don't know, what, I don't know what the compound is. <laughs> is, it, is it a tube? Is it a box? Is it a... It's in a tube, yeah. It looks like toothpaste, but you wouldn't want to get them confused. Trombotine, yeah. yeah. Trombotine. I have mixed them up before. <laughs> Drink water, it went straight down. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. I, I'm, I'm spending too much time on this. I've got to move on. So, yeah. But yeah. look after your instruments and take them to a professional. And next time I'm going to ask him the same question. He, I bet he knows somebody's name. He's just going to be like, oh, it's... it's, it's. <laughs> well, Can we get like an order queue here? Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm excited to see where your career heads and, and see you back in the States. Um, I, I would love to maybe sometime come to London. I've never uh, heard the London Symphony in your hall. And I, I mean, I have with recordings, but I never have live. Mm. How is your hall? Not great. You can hear everything in it, but it's very, very dry. Oh, really? So, um, yeah, the good point, it feels better out in the audience than it does on stage. But when you're on stage, you don't get any resonance back from the hall. But in, in the hall, if everybody's, if everybody's playing the right, the right, I say the right way, but playing um, in a unified way, it mm -hmm. does work. Um, but in terms of playing and performing and getting that joy of the, the feedback whilst you're doing it. We just love going on tour and going to places like yeah. Sun Toy Hall. Actually, I just played, oh, I just played out yeah. the front in Sun Toy Hall. Really? Yeah, that was very special. We did the uh, Takamitsu Phantasma Cantos piece with um, Simon Raddle and the um, London Symphony Orchestra. And that was very, very special for me. But that hall, I mean, that's, I mean, top three or four yeah. for sure. In the world. Yeah, Absolutely. I think so. Yeah. The Berlin film and he's good, you know. Um, so we, yeah, in a way, it's great because the orchestra always goes up a few gears when we travel, because mm -hmm. um, we're used to having to work really hard to make it a great sound. But um, well, I'm excited. If if you don't know Peter's sound, um, where where can they find you at? Online. I mean, I need to get some new YouTube stuff. Maybe we can do that. Yeah. Okay. Cause, so cause all, all my YouTube stuff is terrible now. It's really old. Okay. So <laughs> your website is. Um, currently being constructed, but it'll okay. be finished in a month, two okay. months. And it's, it's going to be? PeterMoreTrombone.com. So uh, it's PeterMoreTrombone.com. Yeah. And then um, you, you have Facebook? Fa uh, Facebook I'm not so big on, but Instagram is the big one now Instagram, for me. Okay. Um, Twitter, I just talk about football. Yeah, so, that's but fine. But Instagram's the, the, the big one for me, really. Um, I keep hearing about TikTok. Is that any good? Uh, I don't have the time. I mean, I, yeah. I look at social media as, as a musician or somebody with a product. And as a musician, your, your product is your sound and your, your, mm. your, your, you, your voice. But, but then the problem with that then is then if you upload a, a video of you playing online, then you've got to think about the microphone because it, it might not sound like you sound in a room. So that's more things to think about, surely, because if you're just recording it on a phone, you're not going to get the full. Oh no, and th that's absolutely right. And yeah. I, I think you should be um, uh, investing in your future with microphones, where mm -hmm. whether it be a, a nice cardioid. Uh, invest in yourself. <laughs> invest in your in your recordings. Absolutely. And but learn how to use it as well, though. Okay, so we have uh, YouTube. YouTube. You have yeah. a YouTube channel. Yeah. Do you what? know what? This conversation is just making me think I just need to do more. <laughs> I have a YouTube channel, but there's nothing good on there. There's an old video from when I'm about 11, and what's then something your, I made over COVID. What's your YouTube channel? I th I'm not sure. Is it not just your email address? I'm not, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Oh. I'm not faking this. I just, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> there's a few things I'm going to do in the follow-up interview where I'm going to ask him about his repair tech. Um, and no, mm. and as a musician, this is part of our uh, getting our products out there. It's and, very important. And um, we're going to work on this a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe the Americans can work on their coffee. Yeah, this, this is, is this, this was is not bad. good. This is not good. So anyway, I really appreciate you coming out. Pleasure. Thanks, thanks for talking. For, thanks for a great day. We'll, yeah. we'll see you around. Brilliant. Cheers.